Starting with chapter three in your book, which is part one of your book, you will spend a considerable amount of time dealing with the actual physical effects of drugs, physical and psychological as, as well. Uh, consider that drugs are generally broken down into three broad, loosely defined categories you could term to be uppers, downers, and then the all-arounders. Um, uppers are generally considered to be stimulants. Those are drugs that we have traditionally defined as central nervous system stimulant drugs. You may think of drugs like cocaine, um, caffeine, tobacco or nicotine, which resides therein, um, or other drugs that pep you up or give you energy as being stimulant drugs. Obviously, the downers or the depressants are drugs that slow down your central nervous system. Drugs that help you go to sleep, drugs that help you relax, drugs that help you deal with anxiety, drugs that in general slow down the human process or the body process are considered to be downers. Now, the all-arounders has a catch-all term that basically gets all the other drugs under one umbrella. Some of these drugs include antipsychotics. Some of these drugs include prescription drugs. Uh, many of them may include drugs that are legal or illegal. Um, steroids, for example, typically are performance-enhancing drugs, although they are not necessarily central nervous system stimulating drugs. Hallucinogenic drugs, for example, have, are present in just about every part of society, at least on some level. However, hallucinogenic drugs can produce short-term stimulant effects and also short-term somatizing effects or sleepless or sleepiness, um, depressive type of states. Uh, if you may have heard of drugs like LSD, lysergic acid diethylamide, both the 25 and 49 and, and other derivatives of that drug, that is a drug that has a tremendous spectrum of behaviors associated with it. Some people can lay down and lay for hours while being on their trip. Other people feel extremely hyper, extremely energetic. They can spend a lot of time expending quite a bit of energy. Some people feel, respond great sensitivity to cold. Other people can dress in basically summer wear and go out in the snow and not perceive cold. These are all drugs that alter perception and reality. Hallucinogenic drugs are particularly problematic because they are almost never by themselves considered to be drugs that are potential, that, are potential, that have the potential for abuse. For example, in lab rats, we know that administering cocaine or heroin leads to reinforcive behaviors. Essentially, the animal will get to a stage where it will keep pressing the button until it will either overdose or die, continuing to give itself more drug. Hallucinogenic drugs do not work that way. In fact, animals in clinical trials tend to not to repeat the dose. And most people do not abuse hallucinogenic drugs, psychoactive drugs that cause hallucinations. However, if you think about, let's say, the 1960s era in the United States, hallucinogenic drugs became a major social issue, primarily because they normalized behavior that was considered to be deviant. It is very difficult to conform to normal social behavior if you are high on LSD. Many social norms become very, very relaxed. They also become very fluid, uh, very interchangeable. So as a result, we saw tremendous impact on the control of hallucinogenic substances. Things like mushrooms, which contain psilocybin, even things like, you might have heard of licking frogs or toads to get high off of those. Those drugs are not necessarily regulated, you can't outlaw a frog, but you can regulate the intentional use of trying to get high off of one. Obviously, this poses tremendous problems for law enforcement and regulators and anybody who wants to deal with drugs on a real issue. So as you think about a lot of these issues regarding the different types of drugs and their effects, you will also notice the transition to the next section of your, of your text, which deals primarily with measuring the patterns of use and the patterns of abuse. By the way, be careful when you read those two terms. Use and abuse are typically two different terms, even though they are oftentimes very closely related in literature. Consider, for example, how we find out the current status of drug use in our society. Uh, we have many methods. Obviously, everything from admissions to hospitals for overdoses, those would be the objective measures. We can look at patterns of people who are being admitted, testing their blood, saliva, urine, etc., figuring out the amount of drugs that are in their system, and then regulating drugs that are causing the most problems from a health perspective. Very few drugs result in those kinds of situations, meaning people who actually have acute intoxication and end up in the hospital. So we use many other methods to kind of triangulate or get at a clear picture of drug use and drug abuse. Legal drugs are fairly easy to monitor. For example, alcohol is regulated. We know the sales because we have the figures. Uh, we know the tax dollars and revenue that the alcohol brings in. Similar things happen with pharmaceuticals. Similar things happen with tobacco. 
um, caffeine, et cetera. Legal drugs, we can more or less gauge who is using them. Illegal drugs are a bit tougher. It's not like you can go out on the street and give somebody a questionnaire and ask them, hey, when was the last time you used heroin? They're not going to tell you. However, we can find out to a certain extent where the drugs are being used, where they're being distributed, who is using them, how much they are using them, and how much of a problem we can anticipate those drugs to have. Typically, we use self-report surveys. Self-report surveys are typically administered to middle school to high school age children. Uh, that's a great way of finding out information. However, we also have methodological problems. One, people either underestimate or overestimate their drug use. Some people are uncomfortable disclosing their drug use. Furthermore, high risk, very persistent drug users are typically not in schools taking surveys. So we end up missing them from our sampling frame. Trying to figure out where exactly the drugs use are being, where the drugs are being consumed is therefore problematic. Another way we can look at this is look at it from a law enforcement perspective. What are the cops on the street finding? Are they arresting more people with a particular kind of drug? Are certain drugs causing more and more problems for law enforcement? Again, that is a good source of data. However, law enforcement tends to focus on drugs that are the most problematic at any given point in time. Which brings us to other concerns, such as the link between drugs and crime. If you consider that drug use in itself, or at least the behaviors surrounding drug use, are in themselves criminal, then asking if drugs cause crime is a little bit like asking if fires cause fire. It is a tautological argument that is very difficult to disentangle. So as you read your text, and as you try to determine what the true extent of drug use is, keep in mind that methodology, sampling size, populations, as well as those who are doing the research, are oftentimes guesstimating what the real extent of the drug use is. In other words, it's hard to come up with an objective measure.